it's rough out there today. Uh, uh, hi, my name's Abel, keeper of sheep. Now, you might recognize that name because when my, I was born, my mama thought I was going to be such an amazing kid, and she thought I would be an amazing keeper of sheep. So she gave me the name of the first keeper of sheep, Abel. Now, I always thought that was really exciting until I got a little older. I heard some of the stories about Abel, you know, and his brother was Cain, and he annoyed his brother a lot, and it didn't really end that well for him. So I kind of was not so excited about my namesake after that, but that's a whole other story and a whole other set of things that I did wrong in life. But right now, my job today is to kind of tell you about some things that have happened in my life that were honestly pretty amazing and um, you know there's times in your life when things happen that you just kind of finally get it. It, it, it it just it hits in your head and you get it now I think in your time you call it an epiphany well I didn't even know how to spell that much less what it meant but but the truth is I've had times in my life when amazing things happen to me and I just sort of got it finally. So here's, here's what it is. Now, since I'm a, a keeper of sheep, uh, my job is to keep sheep. And so about five miles out of the town of Bethlehem, there's this tower in an area where we kept our sheep. Now, the way that worked out is this. Um, we, we had a very particular job around or leading up to Passover our job was to raise and take care of all the sheep that had to do with the Passover sacrifice. Now, for those of you that are a little shy on your, your, your history, uh, the Passover was this really big celebration that involved um, uh, sacrificial lambs, and there was a great meal that was had, and it was to remember the time when Jews like myself and my family w would have been in, uh, in bondage uh, and um, God delivered us in a pretty miraculous way out of bondage. Now, that's the way that happened. Now, <clears throat> um, so, so we celebrate that all the time through this thing called Passover. And if you don't remember, that's back when the ten plagues thing happened. So are you with me here? Okay, so, so the Passover. So we have the Passover feast. And so my job and my brothers and, and our friends that do the, the whole keeper of sheep thing were to take care of and raise up sacrificial lambs. Now, I don't know if you knew this or not, but sacrificial lambs, and this is kind of my claim to fame, uh, we raise lambs that, have, that are absolutely perfect and don't have any scratches on them. And they can't, you know, they've got to be just the right kind of sheep so that they're perfect to offer to Jehovah God. So, several years back, um, is when this all kind of began. And we were raising the sheep for the Passover, and a lot of things had happened. There was a bunch of new taxes coming, which always happens, but, but it, these were pretty heavy. And, and so people were gathering in Bethlehem, and they were going to be taxed, and uh, we, were taking, we were out taking care of the sheep. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but people don't really like shepherds that much. And... There's one really big reason why. Would you like to guess what it is? They stink. Of course it's that they stink. It's just like you can't hang out around sheep without them stinking all the time. And so, you know, I like going into town once in a while, but I get a little weary of when I'm walking down the road. People are kind of cross the street and walk on the other side because I know they know that I stink. And so... <clears throat> I'm not exactly the most uh, loved, or at least I don't feel the love all the time. And, and so, but really, we're just considered simple shepherds that do a job. So there was this one night when my brothers and you know, my friends and I, we were out doing the thing, keeping these sheep, getting sheep ready for the Passover. And all of a sudden, the entire sky lit up. And I've been known to exaggerate, exaggerate a little bit when I tell my tales. But I'm telling you, there had to be 100,000 angels. There was a whole host of angels out there. We were just out minding our own business, tending the sheep, and all of a sudden, wham! And it was so big. 
we started backing up and I tripped over a rock and I'm laying on my back and it scared me to death. My brothers were all cowering like this and I'm just going, ah. And we were scared to death and the angel said, don't be afraid. And you know what I thought? Easy for you to say. And so, so they said, don't be afraid. We bring really great news, glad tidings. And, and, and here was the good news. Today born in the city of David, Bethlehem, is Christ, the Messiah. And then they said, you're going to be able to find him. Because what will happen is you'll go into the city, and he's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes or swaddling cloths, and he's going to be in a manger. Now, lots of women, you know, kind of bind up their kids and things like that so they'll feel warm and, and all cozy and they won't roll out of the bed and things like that. But <clears throat> it's not every day you see a baby in where the stall is. You, you, you're following what I'm saying. And so, <clears throat> so we finally kind of got our composure but I got to tell you, those words they used, they weren't lost on us because I've been to the worship at the synagogue. We've been to the temple. And we've had these opportunities to hear the stories about the prophecies of the coming one, the anointed one, the Messiah that was going to come. And so as soon as we heard this, we're going, this is really, really big. And so without thinking, after we stopped being so afraid, we ran right into the city and we searched around all the places that would have like stalls attached to ends. And we got there and sure enough, there was this little baby swaddled up and in a manger. And as soon as we saw that baby, we knew that this was the anointed one, the Christ child, the Messiah. We knew that this baby, and here's what we did. We all fell on our knees. Not that we're used, not used to being on earth, but we fell on our knees, and we worshiped this child because we knew this was the one that we'd heard about for years. My grandpa's grandma and grandma and, and, and all, all the teaching that happened. We knew that this was the child, the anointed one. And we sat there and we worshiped and we sang songs to God. And we just, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then, in the middle of all that, and my brothers are still praising God, I look up over the stall, or not the stall, but the manger, and the, the haze kind of coming out. And I can smell things over on the side that we don't want to talk about. But I can remember just barely creeping up over the manger. And there was this cute little baby all swaddled up. And I thought, you know what? That looks just like what we do to those little lambs when we're taking care of them for the Passover. Because you see, one of the things that we do is since these little lambs have to be perfect and they can't be scraped up, one of the things we'll do is kind of bind them up and put them in the manger and let them eat the hay. And, and, and that way they don't get trampled by the other big sheep because sheep are like pigs. And they'll just... They'll like all they want is something to eat. And so you have to kind of protect them a little bit. And when you swallow up those little lammies and you put them in these kind of big giant feeding troughs, they just look so cute up there. When I was looking at the baby Jesus, I thought, you know, he's as cute as those little lambs there. And then all of a sudden, so I'm laughing, I tell my brothers, and they thought it was kind of funny. But then all of a sudden, it struck us. This is a pretty big deal. And this is when I had my first, first epiphany, or my next epiphany, or this understanding. Do you get this? That the God of the universe came looking for us shepherds, and we're nobody in our society. We stink. People don't want to be around us. And he came to us first and announced that his child that he was sending was coming to this planet. And all of a sudden I realized, in my heart of hearts I realized, I'm incredibly important to the God of the universe. He cares about the littlest of people. And if he cares about me, then he must care about everybody. And all of a sudden, something starts swelling at me. And trust me, I don't usually search out people very much 
just simply because of the stink thing and the rejection's a little hard, you know. And myself and my brothers kind of looked at our set, looked at each other, and we jumped up off our knees and we went around to everybody. And we told them what happened, that the, that the angels had come and that there was 100,000 of them. And since I exaggerate a lot, they usually they didn't buy the story so much. But, but we were telling them about this whole thing and about amazing thing that happened and that the Christ child was right where he was and that this was the, the anointing one, the one that was promised from God. And we got up and told everybody that would stand still long enough, and we did it for days. Now I want you to fast forward just a little. Because at that moment when I realized that God had come looking for us and he sent angels to come specifically to us and he gave us a job to come and worship the child and how important we were to him and how important everybody else was and, and this thing in me that could not keep it quiet. I pondered that for years. Now just fast forward about 33 years later. It's been a little over 33 years since I knelt before the Christ child. And a few weeks back, although I'd heard things for years, there was a story about this man named Jesus. And he said he was the anointed one of God. The one that was sent to save the world, all men. And the story that came back to us is that they had killed him and all he'd ever done was love people and care for them, invest in them. And say that God wants to know you de desperately and I want to have a relationship with you. And they put him on a cross there. I was told I didn't get to go. But then, as the stories kept rolling in a few days later, this is what I heard. There was an empty tomb. And the minute the guy said that to me, I dropped to my knees. And I looked up to the father and I said, Father, this was your son. And I remembered back to all the years and years and years that I'd bound up those little bitty lambs and put them up in the manger so they wouldn't get hurt. And I understood that night when I had on my knees and I saw that cute little baby wrapped up in that manger that night, that it really was the son of God. You know what I did that day? And I've never stopped since. I got up off of my knees from worshiping. And I did what I did that first night. Like I never have before. It's coming out of me. I can't keep it contained. That Jesus Christ is the Lord. And he came to find me. And to save me. And he wants to do the same for every single person. This is what I want to know is what will you do with that Christ child? like to sing this little song for you and ask you to help us out. I'm going to teach you the chorus to it, and that'll be your part, the chorus. It tells the Christmas story, okay? You're ready. Here's your part. I'll sing the chorus for you once and then ask you to sing it with me, and that'll be your part throughout the song. Baby was born in Bethlehem, came to save the world from sin, and to all who worship him, oh, he sets him free. Try it with me. And the baby was born in Bethlehem, came to save the world from sin, and to all who worship him, oh. Long, long time ago.
ago Isaiah foretold A baby would be ripped out He'd be born Emmanuel That's a virgin And a baby was born in Bethlehem Came to save the world from sin And to all who worship him Oh, he sets him free on that night, the stars did shine, and the angels did sing. Shepherds came on bended knee to the one born King of Kings. And the baby was born in Bethlehem, came to save the world from sin, and to all who worship him, oh, he sets them free. Wise men, they followed that star. It was so unusual. Saw that baby and they fell on their face saying, hey, we're no fools. And the baby was born in Bethlehem. Came to save the world from sin. And to all who worship him, oh, he sets him free. A stable is a very strange place for a king to be born. Tells me he will come to all who open their heart's door. And the baby is born in Bethlehem, came to save the world from sin. And to all who worship him, oh, he sets him free. Once more on the chorus. And the baby was born in Bethlehem. Came to save the world from sin. And to all who worship him, oh, he sets him free. He sets him free. Thank you for tuning in to CNN, the Christmas News Network. I'm Dave Blitzer, your host for today's show. And this morning we have with us a very special guest, a real live magi. So if you could welcome to the studio, Balthazar. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Have a seat there. So, let's get straight to it. What's it like to be a Magi? Uh, well, first of all, I'm a Magus. Uh, Magus, singular, Magi, plural. It's kind of like a cactus and cacti. Uh, but, but we Magi, I mean, the word Magus comes from a Greek word, Magus, which uh, refers to things like a sorcerer or a magician. Sorcery, so like Harry Potter? Well, not exactly. Um, we're more like the Jedi Knights of, of the world that you guys inhabit. The, the Magi were wise men who lived long ago. Uh, I mean, we wise men were, were kind of known the world over for, for various things. I mean, some folks thought of us as having these supernatural magic powers. Some thought we could see into the future. Some thought we could interpret dreams. Some just saw us as being especially wise. Some of us saw us as good, as good craftsmen. Uh, a rumor has it that one of our, our friends is working on a device called the Clapper. So a, a variety of different, of different things and different abilities have, have been attributed to, to us. But really, when you graduate from Magi College, everyone pretty much has the same major. And we all kind of major in astrology and studying the night sky. Not, 
not the horoscopes of the local papers, but more like learning what the, the movement of the heavens tell us about the world around us. I mean, we really have invested ourselves in, in looking at the sky and figuring out what that all means. And, and because of all our, our wisdom, we're often brought into political affairs and, and we give advice to kings and so forth. So even in the lands of, of Persia and Babylon, we're known for our wisdom and for our, our political prowess. Hmm. Sounds like you guys have a great re uh, reputation. Absolutely. Well, depending who you ask. <laughs> If you ask the Greek culture, they'd say wonderful things about us, all the things I've mentioned and possibly more. If you ask the Jews, the, the problem is that we've had a long history. And in, back in the, you know, the stories of guys like Daniel, uh, I mean, the Magi really were the, the enemies of God's people. And ever since then, the Jews have really seen us as these foreign barbarians and not valued our wisdom, but kind of uh, dissed us for not really worshiping their God. Hmm. So not really the best of uh, relationships with God's chosen people. Uh, now, we've been getting reports that three kings had traveled afar to see a king from Judea. Can you confirm this information? Well, I should point out as a magi that Christmas cards are not peer-reviewed literature. Uh, so the, the picture we often have... Of, of three wise men coming to the manger scene isn't necessarily historically accurate. I mean, there were so many of us that the whole city was in an uproar when our, our caravan pulled into town. I mean, even the local King Herod, uh, you know, we, we got their attention. Um, but really, uh, the, the whole thing was mainly because we had to come to visit this child, Jesus, that, that our story is, is told, uh, because we knew that, that, that all of these signs were, were pointing to the arrival of a great king. Hmm. Uh, okay, so... Uh, now, this might be a bit confusing for the folks, because back when all this happened, our producer, King Herod, he, he wanted us to really keep things quiet. Uh, but how did you know where to find this Jesus? Well, there's two things that we wise men know a lot about, the books and the night sky. And we, we knew from reading just all kinds of stories, both some Greek, some Jewish, that there really was this expectation culturally of a, of a great king to come out of Judea. And we knew culturally that many times we, we associated the, the stars in the sky as, as heralding the arrival of some great king, the birth of some great king. So naturally, we, we, when we saw the star in the sky that evening in, in, those, in those times, we, we put two and two together and we recognized that, okay, this star pointed us to, to a king. So we, the mag, we magi followed a star to find the person of Jesus. A, a star? What kind of star are we talking about? Well, to be honest, we never really could agree on exactly what we were seeing. Uh, I mean, we had stories about something called Halley's Comet that had passed through the, the region about five years prior to that. But we really didn't think that that's what we were seeing that day. Some others thought that we were seeing some kind of celestial explosion out there. But we really couldn't understand what that would be either. And some others thought it was some kind of constellation of different movements of things. And even those of us with you know, our, our apps on our smartphone couldn't quite decipher what we were seeing out there in the, sky, in the skies. So really what we had to conclude is that this is some kind of supernatural phenomenon that was in some way leading us to something completely unprecedented and completely unheard of until now. Fascinating. So you, you get there and you find a baby? Well, not really. I mean, we, we magi are, are men, so we don't really pay attention to things like age or birth weight or things like that. Uh, but when we got there, I mean, we, we took our time traveling there because the star was leading us. When we got there, he was around, I don't know, one or, or, or two. Uh, really, we were, we were there just to be able to, to give him his gifts, gifts like this one right here. Uh, wonderful. So th that reminds me, you know, in a couple minutes here, we're, we're going to have our, our sponsor. We'll be pitching the latest tech gadgets and toys. So what practical or fun gifts did you give the child? Uh, we brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh. Gold, uh, frankincense, you, and myrrh, yes. You, what in the world? Do you, you don't have kids, do you? 
I, I do not. We magi are busy men with our books. <laughs> <laughs> why, why in the world these gifts? There must be some something going on. Well, I mean, uh, certainly we all know that gold, of course, is extremely valuable. So that's, that's kind of a, a gimme. I mean, that's, that's the equivalent of a Walmart gift card in today's, <laughs> today's parlance. But frankincense and myrrh, I, I mean, these were, these were all also extremely valuable gifts. And, and if you read the different literature that's out there, I mean, frankincense and myrrh both had their own symbolic qualities. I mean, they were used for religious purposes, sometimes for burial, but, but really it was the, the value alone that made them such good gifts. I mean, the frankincense in particular was something really valuable for, for things like royalty and, and, and things that you would give to a very wealthy person. I mean, during that time, Calvin Klein was putting out some really wonderful brands of incense that uh, was extremely valuable. So, so the whole point was that, uh, you know, we wanted to give these, these gifts to, to, this, um, to this king. Okay, well, I, I'm sorry, though. These still don't sound like gifts that you would bring to a young child. Well, Jesus was no ordinary child, and so these were no ordinary gifts. They, they were precious, they were valuable. So, so the whole point was these gifts were gifts people gave to a king, and Jesus was king of the Jews. He was king of kings. Now, here's what uh, all the folks at, at home uh, and in the audience pro probably don't understand. You, you understood Jesus as the king of the Jews, and, and yet your relationship with the Jews was not a particularly good one. So you make this long journey. Why? I mean, what, what are you doing there? Well, that's a good question, one that we, we've asked ourselves over the years. And as we look back, and as the child has grown, and now that there are stories and, and books written about him, you, we have these various biographies of, of this person, of this Jesus. And one in particular, Matthew, tells this whole story about how Jesus came to offer the kingdom to his own people. And even the people that, that should have received him with open arms rejected him. They crucified him as criminal. And it's not really about being Jewish in particular, because there were many righteous Jews who recognized Jesus for who he was. His own parents, of course, Mary and Joseph, were incredibly righteous people. But the larger story is that Jesus' own you know, Jewish people, by and large, did not really recognize him as their king. They rejected him. And so the story of we magi is recognizing that even though the people closest to Jesus didn't worship him, we kings from far away came to worship him. We are the ones that first acknowledged his kingship here in Jesus' overall story. And so what the magi, what we magi teach all of us is that those who, who don't know Jesus can come find him. That those who seem far away can come near to the person of Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're a wise man or a TV host or a member of the studio audience, like a kid, an adult. It doesn't matter what kind of car you have in the driveway, where you go to school, where you go to church. We're all called in some unique way to come find Jesus and recognize him for who he is and for what he's done. Because as we look at these biographies of Jesus, we see that the child grew. He grew into a man who performed many miraculous things. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. And the, the, the stories even conclude with him raising himself from the grave. So we, we have these elaborate stories that, that call us and invite us to come find Jesus, not merely as king, but also as savior. And to recognize that in Jesus, we, we have the promise of forgiveness and also personal transformation. And that's something that, that we Magi are still wrestling with today, that to wrestle with the whole idea that there can be a savior like this. And one thing that's been sticking with us even recently as we've been reading books from, from today's day and age, we, we love the writings of a guy named C.S. Lewis who wrote those beloved Narnia novels. But Lewis also writes elsewhere about how if the stories about Jesus aren't true, if they're only stories, if they're only legends designed to sell Christmas cards, then Christianity isn't very important at all. But if the stories about Jesus are true, if he really came and did the things that the Gospels say that he did, then Christianity is of immense importance. The one thing that Christianity can never be is moderately important. 
so if we listen to these stories about Jesus, then we, we all have that choice to make, whether we're going to come and find the truth here in this person of Jesus, if we're going to listen, if we're going to draw near. There, there may not be a star in the heavens guiding us. Uh, not, not today, but we still have truth ringing loud and clear through Scripture, through the church, through God's people. And we have that, that, that time, even during this, this holiday season, to examine ourselves and ask ourselves whether or not we're willing to have the courage to lay aside our doubts, lay aside our complacency, and to come and to worship Jesus, not for who we want him to be, but for who he, he is, uh, reigning as king and, and the promise of his coming lordship in the future. Let's just go ahead and pray as a studio audience here. Father, we are grateful for the message of Christmas. We're grateful for the message of your son, our savior. We're thankful that uh, your, your son came as king, but also came as humble child. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be active uh, this morning, this season, uh, just in life in general, uh, that we would be uh, sensitive to your leading, that we would not shy away from truth because it seems inconvenient or because it, it caused us to change our, our lives in some way, but rather because we see the glory and the beauty of you and your son and his kingdom, and that we would be drawn to it in a way that uh, changes our lives and just magnifies your greatness and your beauty. We ask all these things in your son's name and by your spirit's power. Amen.